Hey Gear Seekers, I'm Nick. Recently we did a video talking about 12th Gen for editing and content creation. And in that video, I mentioned that I wanted to put together a Threadripper Pro system to kind of compare the two systems. And then again, we're gonna do another video where we rigorously test both systems to see which one would be better for me personally. And you can come to your own conclusions from that. So what we're gonna to do today is another one of those style of videos where you're gonna come and build with me. However, this one is slightly different. We're not gonna be using a case today because of the size of the board that we're gonna be using, but you are gonna be building with me and we're gonna be putting together this Threadripper Pro test system. And we're going to test it out with the same benchmark that we used the other day to see what the dealio is. So without further ado, let's get building. Let's do something completely overkill for science. This video is brought to you by Aorus and their range of laptops powered by NVIDIA GeForce RTX 30 series GPUs. Whether you choose an Aorus laptop for high-end gaming or Gigabyte's Aero series for gaming and creating on the go, Gigabyte's laptops include NVIDIA's GeForce RTX GPUs that provide all the performance you need to get your stuff done. If you're a gamer, you'll love the high refresh rate display of the Aura 17X. And if you're a content creator, you'll love the 16 inch 4K OLED display in the Aero 16. Both the Aura 17X and the Aero 16 have either the GeForce RTX 3070 Ti or the GeForce RTX 3080 Ti GPUs to choose from. Click the link in the description to learn more. These are the ridiculous parts we've got lined up for today's video. First up, we've got the WRX80 Sage from ASUS. This board is probably one of the most ridiculous motherboards that has ever been made. Look at this thing. It's just mental. Why would you need this? Because Threadripper Pro. This isn't Threadripper Pro 5000, obviously, because they're not available for us regular humans just yet, but this is the Threadripper Pro. 3975WX, this is the 32 core CPU. I've also got a random PCIe Gen 4 M.2 drive. I don't remember what it is because I pulled the heatsink off quite a while ago. This CPU supports eight channel memory. So it's optimal to use eight DIMM modules for this. Now the RAM looks different, but the truth is they're both the same. So they're the same timing, same memory. They're just physically different modules, but they're actually the same. So yeah, hopefully nobody cries about that. The cooler is a Noctua NHU14S TR4 from memory. And I wanted something that basically was going to be trouble free and will allow us to get all the testing done. For the permanent system though, it would be water cooled for sure. I've got a Thermal Grizzly Carbonaut pad. So I don't need to use thermal paste because Threadripper chips use a lot of thermal paste. And this is just gonna make it a little bit nicer to pull the cooler off when I need to. And lastly, the same GPU as last time, as promised, the MSI RTX 3090 Ti Gaming X Trio. And lastly, the case. That's right, ladies and gents, you guessed it. It's an open bench table with a Cooler Master 1300 watt power supply because for a system like this, we're gonna need all the juice we can get. So let's get building. As mentioned, the CPU is the AMD Ryzen Threadripper Pro 3975WX. This is a workstation grade CPU. You can actually use this in a server as well. Basically, it's just an epic CPU in a Threadripper package. It's not exactly what it is, but it just gives you an idea of the type of performance you can look at with something like this. With Threadripper, it's always wise to use the included torque wrench because the sockets need to be torqued to spec. There's actually a torque measurement on the top that will tell you what the torque settings are. If it's over tightened, it won't work. If it's too loose, it won't work. I've talked about this in the past, but there is an order that you need to do these in as well. So to open, it's three, two, one. So three, two, and one, and one will release the socket. So it's wise to kind of hold the retention system down so it doesn't accidentally fling up because some, some sockets do fling up and some don't. So that one does fling up. Lift up the socket carrier with these two little blue sections here. And we're gonna drop the CPU into this receiver, but it's always wise to double check that both sides of the receiver go in. So both sides are in and you'll, it makes like a little 
notch click as it drops into the receiver correctly. I always do this about three or four times just to make sure. And then we need to remove the socket cover. This is where it can get a little bit hairy because there's like 4,000 socket pins. Like not even making that number up. There is quite literally that many. Lift up the socket cover. Use your index finger and your thumb to push the CPU down and it clips into place. And we want to close the retention system. To close it, it's one, two, three. And you need to use the torque setting. Now you'll see this, right? Keep tightening. It takes a lot of tightening and then Right. You'll also notice the socket is rotated from normal Threadripper socket because this is in the server orientation. This is to do with coolers in server cases and also shortest path to memory. All right, and then we get to the end of it. I haven't actually used this board before, so there's going to be quite a bit of BIOS updating and configuration stuff that I'll have to go through. I might, might share that, might not. And that's it. For a board like this, there's actually not that many M.2 slots. However, you get a storage card with this board, which allows you to install four drives with bifurcation in one of these slots. But you'll notice that when I'm filming, I do things really awkwardly so you guys can see most of what I'm doing as well. I'm not gonna be using thermal paste for this installation because it just uses too much. And this is gonna be probably a temporary setup for this anyway, because if I do end up going this solution, it will be water cooled. So we've got these carbon ore pads, basically they're electrically conductive. So you do need to be careful when applying them, but it's a sheet and these can be infinitely reused unless you damage them. And basically all you need to do is put them on the IHS of your CPU and then lower your cooler into place. But be careful that the pad doesn't move around when you lower the cooler on. With this cooler, it's actually quite good because you get a visual indication of how tight it is basically because of the socket retention system and the cooler mounting system. So that's mounted. Now we'll put the fans on last because we need to put the RAM in first because we need to deal with the RAM clearance. For these older Corsair modules, I'm going to put these on the inner channels and then we'll put these other Corsair modules in the other slots. Can't exactly call this next part building because all we're doing really is placing a board on a test bench. It doesn't matter what slot we put this in because there's just so many slots on this board. Beautiful. We're ready to go. Let's see for posts. It's going to take about four or five minutes to post because of the IPMI and all the other crazy server features that are built into this workstation board. Big moment of truth. All right, here we go. Moment of truth, ladies and gents. Fans are very loud. RGB is illuminated on all the RAM modules. This will take a while to post. So we're probably just waiting for everything to finalize. And I'll come back to you once this thing's posted or I'll update you if it's all gone to shit. Post, post, post. Still not posting with this fucking GPU. I literally got it to post in the other room. Yeah, I changed the keyboard because the other keyboards are getting reviewed and I'm not doing it. Let's try this again. Power up, baby. AA means all good, means handed over to the operating system. HDMI 2, no signal, quite literally hit shut down and then powered this back up. It was working a minute ago. Yep, some fan dangling, it posted. And now, after two hours, I need to reinstall Windows. And that is not what the time is at all right now. That's about two hours different to what it actually is. It posts, yay, yay. I knew it was gonna post. I already got it to post. Stupid thing. There are a few things that made this system not want to post. The first thing is the system was actually posting and this monitor was not receiving sync. And the way I figured that out was I actually plugged in the camera monitor that's on this camera that I'm filming on right now to the HDMI port on the GPU and it worked straight away. So I'm gonna have to talk to MSI again about what's going on with this monitor because it wasn't even allowing me to switch the input source without having a sync for a certain input source. I had to plug in another PC to get this to work. Now, I don't usually have this issue with this monitor ever, which is why I haven't ever talked about it. Anytime any input was plugged into this GPU on this motherboard, actually I tried a 3050 as well, it did the same thing. 
I just think it's a bit bizarre. Everything's up and running, everything's running smoothly. 3975WX, 32 core. The RAM, we've got all eight DIMMs populated. Threadripper Pro is eight channel, not quad channel, so eight DIMMs are optimal for this. You can run it on less, I have done that in the past, but this is what I would recommend. And the 3090 Ti is also up and running. So I guess we should run a Puget Bench. Right, so I've got the project launched. We will go Window, Extensions, Puget Bench for Premiere Pro, and we will hit Run Benchmark. I thought I would show you what makes this motherboard unique on my brand new Gigabyte Aero 16 OLED. Yep, this one's got an OLED display. Anyway, yes, this bit of an ad placement. Anyway, this board actually has a built-in IPMI or BMC, and basically what this allows you to do is monitor everything on the board without installing a single piece of software with an IP address that your motherboard spits out to your network. What this means is we can monitor every voltage of everything, every sensor, and anything you can imagine that the board can monitor. You can access this from any computer on your network. So, so if you've ever seen any type of server in the data center or whatnot, this is not new to you, but for people who haven't seen this, it allows me to monitor every single thing. There's heaps of other things you can do. So if there's a blue screen of death, it will capture it automatically. I can do all the fan control. You can video record from here as well. And we can actually do all the fan curves right here. I haven't touched any fan curves yet, but if I do decide that this is my solution, but there's a lot of stuff you can do here. You can update the BIOS and everything from here as well. There's anything you can imagine you can do, you can do. I need to actually update this because I haven't yet. I did update the BIOS with BIOS flashback, but there you go. Just a little bit of info if it's something you've never seen before. The Puget Bench Premiere Pro benchmark is done. Let's take a look at the results. What you're seeing on your screen right now is it absolutely demolished the 12th gen editing PC setup, which actually didn't surprise me, but you got to remember where the 12th gen CPU will gain some ground is when it has that IGP working. And I haven't rebuilt that system yet. So I'm going to do that tomorrow, not on video. And then Hopefully before the end of the week, I'll put out the last part of this mini series and we'll find out which one is going to be better overall. But yeah, this Puget Bench result is crazy. Like it is such a good result. Now, what I'll do is I'll put the link to all the Puget Bench runs that we've done with the various machines in the description down below. So you can take a look, but I'll show you a quick comparison of the two now, just so you don't have to really go and look at that if you don't want. But I will say that if you do take the time to look at the Puget Bench results, you can look at the raw results. It shows you where things perform to get certain points and how they perform with different tasks. So the Threadripper Pro is better at some things, whereas the 12th gen CPU will be better at others. But keep in mind that even with the iGPU support from the one that we built at the end of last year, this still outperforms that one as well. So yeah. Just some food for thought. There's one other video that I want to make because it kind of sparked something inside me. With the motherboards with iGPU support with the display outputs, we know that everyone with the display output is going to allow you to turn on the iGPU. But what we don't know, well, we don't know it for sure, is whether or not boards that don't have display outputs still allow you to enable it. Now, we know that MSI boards are just out of the equation, but we have Asus, Gigabyte, and ASRock to take a look at. And we've got Z690 boards for all of them. So sometime in the near future, probably next week, because I actually really want to know this. Hope you guys enjoyed this video. If you like these type of videos, hit the like button, get subscribed, ring the notification bell. And if you like the music you heard here, which I'm not sure there is any music today, but yeah, click the join button. I actually have been uploading a couple new tracks I've been working on as well. So get joined. Join, join up. I'm out of here. I'm looking forward to the next part. Now that we've got both of these systems up and running, we're gonna drag race them. See which one wins. It's gonna be this one. I can already tell. The Threadripper Pro is gonna demolish it. It's pro I'm probably gonna be switching to Threadripper Pro. But I think the ace up the sleeve is, I need to run Puget Bench on my current editing PC. Oh yeah, that's a good idea. Mm. 
I think my current one's gonna smash both of these, to be fair. <laughs> but this has pro in the name, so it's better, right? Pro. 